host of the workshops and clinics for imaging for SJAA. And he's going to talk about his new equipment and some of the amazing images that he's been getting lately. Take it away. And uh, in case you're wondering what all this video gear is, uh, so I'm sort of self-producing as we go along here. Uh, somebody, a uh, friend asked me to make sure to get this recorded, and uh, we've been working on how to uh, somewhat more professionally record speakers at SJA events. So got some gear here, and that's what all this stuff is. So. Yeah, so I'm here to talk about kind of two things, um, share a little bit about my, my new rig and also some of the Photoshop processing uh, and uh, tricks and, and tips that uh, I've been applying to these new images. So let's go forward here. So um, if you read the Facebook post here, so back in uh, 2014, I think I started this hobby maybe March of, of 2014, and with uh, that scope uh, on a really cheesy tripod uh, before the, the serious mount, serious mount there, uh, th that I got in a, in a catalog uh, because of uh, being at work for my 15 year anniversary at work. You know, they give you a catalog, and I had the TV, and I had the DSLR, and I had luggage, <laughs> you know. And so I thought, oh, I've always kind of wanted to have a telescope. And I did, I think they had like two different kinds or something. And I did a bunch of research and, and picked this, uh, this 90 millimeter Mac CAS. Um, and I don't know if this is really only, you know, like three or four months later, but, uh, you know, you can tell I've already <laughs> hung a ton of junk off of it. And, you know, it looks like I'm auto guiding and I've got a DSLR on there and, and whatnot. So, so this was a, a Facebook post, and you know, it says, "Well, the good news is a pretty cool-looking nebula. The Eagle Nebula uh, should be stunning with more exposure time. Uh, the bad news is I can't take longer than 30-second exposures, and um, so these are these are high ISO shots. So it's probably uh, you know, low on, it is low on the horizon, so extra challenging, and I'm sure I had any number of problems, and you can tell all the junk that's hanging off there, at all kind of angles and stuff, so that was a, an early, and so if we step forward, oh, and there's a mistake in this slide, so we know that this is not really taken with that matte CAS because there are diffraction spikes on the bright, the one bright star there, so it can't be uh, the matte CAS because it doesn't have any diffraction spikes. So this probably, the next scope I bought was a, an eight inch carbon fiber RC. So it's probably early results from, from that. And I have a picture of that rig coming up here. Um, but uh, jump forward to today. So this was the very first uh, results that I got of that Eagle Nebula with my new rig. And there it is on the, on the right there. So uh, it's a it's a 12 inch uh, TPO truss RC, and uh, I've got an astrophysics focal reducer, so that brings it down to f 5.6. And I've got uh, like a lot of people now these new CMOS cameras. Uh, so this is a ZWO uh, monochrome cooled, and uh, they sell it in a kit with uh, a filter wheel and. I got the largest filters that they had to offer in seven, so RGB, LRGB, and the three narrowband filters all in a, in a package there. Um, I already had the mount, but that, that's a Orion HDX110. It's got a 110 pound payload, and that scope is about 50 pounds. And uh, I can almost put it on there by myself. I, I stupidly did it this time. I probably shouldn't do it again. Uh, but it helped that I was able to stand up on a deck and kind of rock it in there. And uh, uh, what else? So, and I've got uh, servo focus control on here, and you can see the Orion uh, Short Tube 80, which is a standard auto guiding rig, and then the QHY 5L, which is equivalent to the Orion uh, Starshoot Pro. It's the same camera, just different firmware. Uh, for guiding.
Okay. So what are the specs of this rig? So, you know, it's way more aperture than, than I had before, right? So it's, you know, the, the area of the mirror is, is the radius squared times pi, right? So it makes a big difference as, as you go up in, in aperture. So it's uh, 304 uh, millimeters in aperture instead of, you know, that first scope I showed you was a, was a 90 millimeter. So it, it seems to me like I'm, I'm getting more detail. Uh, it helps with the surface brightness. Um, Bruce and I were talking as you came in, you know, what's the science behind, does it really help with light pollution? But I, I Googled around and read some things and I'm about to move from Scotts Valley to, to Union City. Uh, so it's gonna be a big hit for my my imaging. I'm hoping I'll be able to do something and that was part of the justification to get more aperture was that it would help with the light pollution situation. And we'll kind of compare and contrast some situations uh, that I've found so far with this. Um, so yeah, and all of these in this presentation are narrow band and they were all taken uh, over the last few weeks under under the moonlight and sometimes through fog and between trees and clouds and all that good stuff. So this particular combination of scope and focal reducer and um, camera with the camera has pretty small pixels um, it means that I'm actually always going to shoot at, at bin 2 which means that instead of imaging with each individual pixel in software it's going to in the camera it's going to treat each group of four pixels as one and normally uh, you would take like your color data bin two and you'd take your your luminance or your most detailed data hydrogen alpha or something in bin one but in this case if you look at the the arc seconds per per pixel here at bin two, it's 0.92 arc seconds per pixel. So if, if amateur scene uh, is typically around two arc seconds per pixel, then the, the rule of thumb or whatever you want to call it, it there's not a lot of, of detail to be gained by, by imaging at less, than point, at less than an arc second per pixel. Um, because you're just you're just oversampling and there's you're, you're just you know oversampling the the scene um, so th the advantage to this here is that you know it it makes it look like the camera has bigger pixels and it it helps even more with being able to capture a lot of uh, light in a in a short exposure which this camera's already really good at um, so anyway I'll always shoot at at bin 2 and um, so this field of view works out to, you know, it's about 26 by 35 arc minutes. So I'm m mainly into deep sky objects, so nebulas and, and uh, galaxies and globulars. So that's a pretty good size for a lot of objects will fit in that frame. So it's not, you know, the, the bigger, super big nebulas, the wide field nebulas, uh, North America, the, the rosette, the heart, the soul, uh, some of those things are too big, but the, and uh, the vast majority of things are, are good. Uh, planetary nebulas are, are too small still, um, so what I may do, I keep threatening, I've got a two inch Barlow, I haven't done it, ever tried it yet, but I'm, I'm gonna, you know, take the focal reducer out, put the Barlow in, and uh, hope I can still achieve focus and uh, uh, I guess put a bunch of extension rings or something and uh, try to go really deep and maybe I'll bend four by four for that um, but anyway uh, so I can't do wide field with this rig but uh, you know I have access to other other gear for that okay so one of the differences, you know, before I was shooting with uh, DSLRs, so, you know, I have a, a, a Canon T3i that's astro modified, and I made it uh, water cooled, which is a whole nother long story. Uh, and I also have a, a, a Nikon D5100, 
which uh, somebody removed the Bayer matrix on, and I was doing some narrow band uh, with that. But um, so in moving from DSLR then into CCD, so you know instead of using Backyard EOS or Backyard Ni Nikon and Astro Tortilla for plate solving, now I'm using Sequence Generator Pro which is a much more automated and everything kind of all in one except for uh, guiding. Um, and so that's, that's one of the, the big changes if you're thinking about switching from, from DSLR to uh, a dedicated Astro Cam or CCD or, or CMOS. Um, I also moved from Deep Sky Stacker to CCD Stack 2 um, I, these days you're probably better off buying PixInsight, right? Just do your stacking rather than don't spend money on, on CCD stack two, but I already had it. So, uh, and I haven't made the jump into, into PixInsight yet. So all the stuff in here is about, about Photoshop. Um, and I, I spent maybe five or 10 minutes thinking about how would I do some of the things I do in CCD stack in in Deep Sky Stacker, and I don't know that, that, that I know how, but um, synthetic luminance for one, and how you would register but not stack uh, different RGB. And maybe it's just because I, I haven't learned how to do that in Deep Sky Stacker, but anyway. All right, so we can dive into this uh, first image here. So this is 75 minutes of uh, data under moonlight. Uh, obviously, you know, it would look better if I, if I went back and got more and more and more. Um, but I was pretty, pretty happy with the results here. Uh, so HA, SI, and O3, three, uh, five minute exposures, 15 of each. I also shot luminance data, but uh, when I brought it into Photoshop, it didn't look anywhere near as good as using the, the HA as the, the luminance, the hydrogen alpha, so I discarded that. Um, I did stack it in CCD stack, and I did do some deconvolution in CCD stack, and later on when I started doing tone mapping and stuff, I realized that I was over deconvolving stuff, and uh, so now I'm not doing that as much. And processed in, in Photoshop, <laughs> So this is the Hubble palette, which is um, hydrogen alpha as green, uh, sulfur as uh, red, and uh, oxygen three as as blue, and then uh, translated into uh, gold versus the the green dominant. And I'll show you how to do that. So these things in orange, I'm going to demonstrate for you here in a minute. Um, I use Camera Raw as one of my secret weapons to do kind of digital development in between the stacked image and Photoshop. Uh, there's various actions in Photoshop that I use. Uh, and I just learned about something called luminance masks. Um, I was at the last workshop I gave uh, hanging out as people came in and overheard three of the night photographers talking about luminance mass. So when I got home, I Googled it and uh, checked it out. And it's kind of, kind of a cool thing. Uh, another tool to add to the toolbox. We'll go into that. And uh, I probably use Gradient Exterminator. One of the things, you know, I've, I've been going uh, really fast with this new rig. And I haven't, I don't think I really have good calibration files yet. So like this has got like four darks or something, but I don't think I've, I, I think my, my filter wheel leaks some light during the day. I can't really take calibration files during the day. So I need to go back at night and redo my bias and get more darks and all of that. So if I, I think I'm adding noise is what I'm trying to say. I'm, I think I'm adding noise with my calibration files now. But if I leave them out, then I've got vignetting and, and other gradients to deal with. So, you know, it's like either way I've got, got gradients and stuff to, to mess with. But Gradient Exterminator is a Photoshop plugin that's, that's one way to deal with that. 
And then uh, there's a lot of different noise reduction programs that you can use with Photoshop. I found this Topaz noise reduction. It's about 80 bucks uh, to be the, the best. And I use that a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the sort of the overall philosophies with, with noise reduction, uh, and you can, there's a, there's a book, it's not in publication anymore, but I think you can still get copies from Amazon. It's called the zone system, but the whole thing comes down to, you know, where you've got low detail, you want to reduce the noise, and where you've got high detail, you want to sharpen in, increase the detail, increase the contrast. So he just talks about, you know, dividing up the scene into different zones and working on them kind of independently. So you might use noise reduction in one and, or a different amount of noise reduction in one, and then you might use other detail enhancing techniques, which we'll go into in, in the others. And that's actually one thing that you could do with the luminance masks is divide up your your picture into different areas that you want to focus on. And then um, oftentimes when I, when I come out of Photoshop, um, I'm, I'm happy and I like the color and everything, but it just doesn't pop. And in this case, uh, you know, there's a program that Google used to make. They've, they've discontinued it, but it's, it's just a, a program for um, dealing with all the photos on your, on your PC. It's called Picasa. And uh, it's got some, some tweaks in there, uh, fill light and uh, uh, an I'm feeling lucky, like the Google I'm feeling lucky. And sometimes that really makes it pop or it's totally overblown, but then you can go back and sort of uh, add a little yourself. But then I've also learned how to do kind of the same thing in, in lab color. We'll talk about it later on. And also you could run it back through camera raw but I haven't found anything that's quite the same, so I'm, I'm sort of sticking with the Google Picasa, but now, now you know my, my secret weapon at the end there. So, so now it's, uh, it's demo time, so let's uh, point out some of this stuff. Um, so I need this up here to remind me what I'm supposed to do. And... So here you see this is this is green because I, it hasn't gone through the the green to, to gold step yet. Um, so this what we're looking at here. Let me make some more room. Uh, so this is just the the red, green, and blue layers, and I want to demonstrate how I bring things into Photoshop and how I stack them up to make an RGB image because I, I do it differently than some other people do. Some people just, uh, you know, they open up the red channel in a color image and, and paste it in there, red, green, and blue. I'm using uh, adjustment layers, hue and saturation adjustment layers. And an advantage to that is, you know, I can, I can control the, the colors a little better and I could also, you know, if I decided that here's here's a practical situation, like a lot of times you have to decide if you want your your hydrogen alpha to be red or your sulfur to be red. So, you know, I can switch one of them from from red to green just by by doing that. And then, you know, I'd have to switch the other one to, to red. Um, so just that quick, you know, I can change the the look of that. So that's why I do the. Uh, adjustment layers. Put this back. 120 and this one was... You guys can jump in anytime with with uh, questions. So the first thing I want to show you is uh, camera raw. So... Um, you said you took uh, 15 shots of 300 seconds so it's like yep. 15 in each color channel, right? The, uh, 15 in hydrogen alpha, 15 in sulfur 2, 15 in oxygen 3. And then I'm going to assign them to colors. So in the, if you looked at those, those spectral lines in the visible spectrum, hydrogen alpha and sulfur are both red yes. and they're close together. 
and then uh, oxygen three is right between green and blue. But you can, uh, to make a pretty picture, you can assign however you want. And the point of that, in, in terms of science, is to reveal the different, the different structures. Um, So this camera has some, some pre, I mean, there's sliders, right, for gain and offset, but there's some presets too. And I'm using the one that says minimum read noise. So you could argue, you know, another preset is, is unity gain. But I'm, I'm, I have a, the club has another camera similar to this, another CMOS camera that's a smaller chip. And I played around with it a lot, and I decided I like the, the minimum read noise. That's the higher it's high. It's higher. It's not highest, but yeah, it's it's. You know, you've got those different sources of noise, and depending on how you set your gain and offset, they interact different different ways. So this is the combination of sliders that gives you the uh, the minimum read noise. Any reason why you that? Well, I guess so. You know, it's a cooled camera, so I'm not worried about thermal noise too much. And uh, I want some gain, uh, but not too much. So, you know, this is, this is kind of a middle of the road. And I'm not seeing a lot of noise, if I, at least if I don't overdo the deconvolution. I'm not seeing a lot of, a lot of noise. I don't know how you would do that. Yeah, they don't have a, an ISO rating. Yeah, yeah, but um, you know we're we're stretching to get to create a dynamic range in in at, down at the bottom. So I don't know that I need a lot of of dynamic range. I don't think you would because you're only imaging in one spectrum. Okay, so. Um, let me show you, this is already adjusted because I had brought this image in before, but so this is camera raw. And, oh, let me, let me back up a second. Uh, you have to teach Photoshop to use camera raw for TIFFs and JPEGs if you want that, because normally it's only going to use it for raw images, right? So um, you go in here to edit. Preferences, camera rods at the bottom, and then down here you can teach it to, to do JPEGs and, and TIFFs. Okay, so that's important because it's a powerful tool for digital development. Okay, so again, th so this is my stacked uh, hydrogen alpha image, and this is what it looks like coming out of CCD stack, even though I did some digital development in, in CCD stack. But it, if I hit auto here, if I can get my cursor on it, boom. So, uh, you know, it's like, oh, it's been stretched, it's been adjusted, you know, so, and sometimes it's overblown, so you can, you know, turn the exposure down, or you could, uh, you know, bring the, bring the blacks up or down, or, or what have you, but, you know, there's a lot of, of quick, a uh, lot of bang for your buck here, basically, by hitting that one button. And if this was a color image, uh, you could adjust the white balance here as well, auto or, or what have you. So I bring the three images in, and they've already been uh, aligned in, in CCD stack, so I don't have to worry about that. And then, you know, I can just uh, control A, Control C to to copy one and then paste it over the top of the of the others, right? So that's that's all there is to that. And then uh, once I get them all in there, uh, I can do this hue and saturation stuff. So I guess I can walk through one of those. And I, I made an action that does them all at, at once, but uh, I'm just learning how to do do actions, but. So what you do is, so you've got this layer, and let's call it uh, HA. So you go down here, and you say hue and saturation. 
Okay, and then in your properties window for that, you say colorize, you set the lightness to minus 50, and you set the saturation to 100, and then you set the color to whichever color you want. So, uh, you know, zero for red, 120 for green, and uh, 240 for blue, but of course, whatever floats your boat, right? I mean, and then uh, we need to do one more thing here. Now you notice the whole image is red now, that's not right, so we have to create a clipping mask. So what that does is it makes the red uh, only apply to that layer below it, and if we then put that layer, get on the layer, if we put that layer in screen mode, then the other stuff will, will show through. So now I've got, I've got two reds in here, but this is just for, for demonstration. So, you know, this is what you, what you end up with. Um, and then, you know, you could go into to each of these uh, layers and work with them individually. Um, you can see I went way over on the deconvolution here, so there's a bunch of noise and stuff, but you could, uh, you know, apply gradient exterminator to get rid of that vignetting. Uh, you know, you could do all your normal curves and, and stretching and whatnot, although um, later when in the next image where we're going to do tone mapping, uh, you know, you probably want to have a lighter, a lighter touch, but this is just going to be a straight um, LRGB in terms of the, the layers and stuff. Um, so if you, if you did all that, and then you could, and you were happy with the color and all that, then you could flatten the image. So let me open my next example. So, oh, I guess, okay, so we'll, one more step. So before I flatten the image, uh, so this is the, the result of that work I just talked about, where I went into to each layer. So let's say if we look at just the blue layer uh, and take off the blue. So, you know, I did some work there to make that look better. Um, here's the... Where's that coming from? Here's the... Um, Here's the SI layer. It looks like I've got a luminance mask on that. And here's the, the HA layer. When you put all those together, it looks like that. And then uh, I decided to use the HA again. So I made a copy of it uh, and used it for luminance. And that gives me that. Okay, open the next one. Okay, let me just check my cheat sheet here. Double palette, green to raw, lum oh, luminance masks. Okay, we can talk about luminance masks. So, um, Greg Benz is a photographer that, that has made some plugins for luminance masks that are free. He also sells something. I didn't try the thing he sells, but there's a, a free action that makes luminance masks. I've got all the, the links at the end that point to these different websites of people I'm talking about, and you can go and see the demos and get the software. Um, so what luminance mask does if we he's got this action create all luminance masks so we'll do that so if we go over here to channels instead of layers now there's a whole bunch of you know he's got the five different flavors of lights 
five different flavors of darks, uh, midtones, and what you can do, light midtones. So these can be masks that you can use in your in your layers. So let's say you just wanted to focus on, you know, kind of the the core of the nebula here with with this one. So if I control click and that makes a, a selection and I go back over here into the layers. Uh, now I've I've got that uh, selection for me and I can further modify it with with feathering or expansion or whatever. Um, but so that's a that's a great way to pick different parts of your of your uh, DSO and um, one thing to keep in mind is these, you know, the marching ants are drawn where there's a 50% a um, pixel selection. So if we go back and we look at that mask, you know, it, it's not all, um, let me deselect here so you can see it. You know, it's not all black and white, right? It's, there's grays in here. So what's your your mask is actually going to have different amounts of pixels selected. It's not going to be, you know, if I did the did the magic wand uh, to to pick this. Let me go back to layers. You know, if if I did that, then it's either going to be on or off across that that border. Whereas with the luminance mass, it's going to be a gradual change, and you can't really see it because of the way that Photoshop does the, the marching ants there. But so anyway, so there's all these uh, different masks then that, that you could use. So that's something I just learned. So that's luminance masks. Uh, and then get back over here. Um, what did I do? Did something, huh? No. No. All right, well, I'm just going to reload it. Uh, I don't need any of these. Okay, so last step on this one. Um, so we stacked up the color, we fixed all the layers, we um, added the, the hydrogen alpha as for detail as a luminance mask. And then I got to this point, I'm like, that's too much green, I, I don't like it. Um, so there's this technique for going from green to gold. So that's an action that I just made. And um, that action is just a bunch of selective color adjustments. If I, uh, from this website here, he walks you through, um, starting here, uh, some selective color adjustments to go from that green look to the gold look. And in fact, if we go on the history here, so that's what we started with. Then the first adjustment gets you there, and the next one gets you there, and there, and then the last one. So that's how we do the green to gold. Any questions? All right, so back to PowerPoint. Okay, let's look at another image. So, again, back in the day, uh, 2014, this is supposed to be the Wizard Nebula. It's kind of a big, ugly mess. 
and frankly, because of images like this and, and worse ones I'm too embarrassed to show that I tried to do with narrow band on a DSLR, which is its own challenge, uh, I didn't even know what, where you see the wizard in that. In fact, I didn't even know it until Bruce told me, looked at my image and said, you need to rotate it 90 degrees so you can see the wizard. Um, so, uh, yeah, so there's the wizard. So do you see him with his hands out and his hat and his nose? Um, so that's the, that's the wizard. So that's what I got with the, the new scope. And Bruce also suggested that I go look at uh, one of the recent Astro Imaging Channel presentations on uh, how a guy made the, an APOD winning, was it APOD? Uh, cave Nebula. And there's a couple techniques that I've stolen or borrowed from him that he borrowed from other people that I'm going to uh, talk about in this, in this presentation. So again, under moonlit skies from Scotts Valley, only 75 minutes of uh, total integration time, HASI03. Um, I left this one in sort of the greenish look. Um, so uh, a lot of the same stuff, but, but we're going to do tone mapping this time. So we'll talk about that. So uh, Annie's Astro Actions are some actions you can buy for Photoshop. And one of the th things she has is a star removal. Uh, I use the HA for luminance again. And uh, then one other uh, tweak in here that's from another website was using lab color, jumping into lab color, making a couple adjustments, jumping back into RGB at the end to try to make it pop. Okay, so back to demo time. So tone mapping, so that's what you're looking at there is the tone map, right? So that's the starless image. And uh, sometimes they look uh, pretty ugly and they don't have a lot of detail, but that's okay because you're going to add the detail back with the with the luminance layer. And in fact, uh, I've sort of learned that, you know, you don't want to spend a lot of time trying to make a lot of detail there because it just turns into to, to a mush when you, when you try to add the luminance on, on top of it. So you're better off, you might even do like a blur uh, to soften it up before you add the, the luminance. All right, so we're going to jump back to Photoshop. Um, and I should have been taking this off so that we're not hiding parts of Photoshop we need to see. Okay, so we start with our, our three color layers again, which those are the, the three color layers. And, uh, you know, if we just added the, the HA as, as luminance, that's what it, what it looks like. Uh, but we're going to do this tone mapping thing, so we would leave that off. And, uh, you know, we'd make it, look, make it look pretty first, and then... Um, So then this is after I've, you know, adjusted the colors and, and whatnot and uh, flattened the colors into a single layer. Now, you know, uh, one of our good friends had pointed out that I had these uh, violet halos, um, and that's the, the result of some interaction between optical coatings between the focal reducer and the, and the filter. And the fix for that is probably way more money than I want to spend on Astrodon <laughs> filters or, or have to do without the focal reducer. But in later images, what I've started doing now is uh, uh, on the color layer, if I'm doing tone mapping, is I just uh, get rid of those stars altogether. Um, so I can just do something, you know, like that. I take more time, but you know, I just go and nuke out all the stars. Uh, and then when I put the luminance back over, 
then at least the halos are white, and then it's a little easier to deal with, or I can try to eliminate the halos. Um, so anyway, that's the, the flattened image, and then we'll go ahead and uh, go to actions. I've got a lot of actions in here. So this is uh, Annie's astro actions here, and then she's got uh, remove stars large image. So it says, you may still have some remnants on larger stars. Use the clone tool to remove. So that's kind of what I was, I was doing, right? I, you just do it after. Um, you know, so you could go in and wipe out the remaining stars um, and create your... And this is where people spend hours. And I have to, you know, I, I, I usually don't demonstrate processing because I'm pretty lazy at it. I mostly just demonstrate image acquisition, but uh, you know, people spend hours on some of these finer details and they get, you know, the results, the results pay off. So that's kind of uh, the tone map. And then go to the next step here. So here we've, we've, and this is Bruce telling me to rotate it so we can see the, see the wizard. So, you know, there's our tone map and uh, there's the, the luminance. And now see those halos are white now, right? Because we, we took out the color underneath them. Uh, and then it looks like I did something different here. Yeah, so I also experimented with reducing the number of stars using uh, actions I think Annie has some, but I think I probably used uh, uh, astronomy tools actions to reduce stars, but I, I think I ended up using using that one. Okay, and then I think the last step was the lab color. Um, Tone map and HA loom. Is that what I've got? Yeah. Okay, so we can do the lab color here. So um, if we're happy with this, you know, we could flatten it, uh, flatten image, discard hidden layers. Okay, so to, one way to make this pop. And the, the link to the website where I learned this is in the appendix. And I'll post the, the video and uh, a PDF of the presentation uh, in the meetup. Um, is you take the image and you jump over into, if I can make my mouse work, into lab color. Then you go into curves. And that was levels. That wasn't what I wanted. Curves. So now you've got different channels in lab color. And you've got lightness, the A channel, and the B channel. So, um, you know, you can try uh, this. This looks a lot like that fill light control in, uh, in Picasa. Um, so you can you know, experiment with different uh, curves here to try to, you know, get your, your final polished image as far as the, the lightness. And, you know, something like that may just make it, make it pop a little bit. And then uh, he tells you, go into the A mode and drag this point to the right by some degree, and you can you know, see kind of what it's doing. And then take note of how far you dragged it and do the same amount up here. And what this is doing is, I think the A is the, is like the blue greens and it, so we're just making those more intense and then you can do the same thing in the B channel. Um, Okay, and it just makes it 
makes it pop a little bit. So, and then you go back into your your RGB uh, mode and save it save it out. So if we go to history, we can probably compare the difference here. Um, yeah, so we went from that to that with the lab color tweak. And so there's probably other ways to to do that, but that's that's a trick I learned recently. Okay, so that's the wizard. Um, let me just check to make sure I covered everything I wanted to cover. Uh, we talked about, oh, no, I missed one, RGB stars. Okay, good thing I checked. There should be another Photoshop in here. Ah. Yuck. Okay, so, uh, so here's some really quick and dirty uh, RGB stars. So again, these are, uh, I think I, did, I do two minutes with the color filters. So again, this is my same uh, hue and saturation adjustment layers. So, you know, if we looked at just the, the, the blue, for instance, and take the color off, you know, there's the, the blue, right? So uh, I'm not worried about noise in the background or any of that stuff because I'm going to probably uh, do, you know, something like pulling the blacks way up because uh, I'm, I'm only interested in the, in the stars. But I need to do that uh, on the whole image, not just the red like I just did. So... Um, so we could say flatten this and then do the, yeah, need a mouse. Pull the black level way down and then, you know, you can um, use actions to increase star colors or, or whatever and then, um, do control A, control C, and you know, paste that over the top, and then um, there's different methods for for blending the the RGB stars in, and I'm surprised that I didn't have that. In there already. Um, so I've done different different methods of blending those in, uh, putting them um, just on top of the color. Uh, you know, cutting the cutting the black out or making a mask with the luminance mask. So there's different ways uh, to add those in. Um, but let's see if I've got the final image in the in the presentation. Yeah, so you can see here that that I've got some color in in my stars. So and really cranked up the the color on those. So because otherwise you just have the violet stars from the narrow band. So sometimes it's nice to put the RGB stars over the top. Okay, any questions? The, there's a moon out and the, I mean, there's a lot of light pollution. So yeah. what if you image something like this on a darker sky? How different is it? Um, yeah, so it, well, so let me talk about the moon for a minute. So, um, so I'm in Scotts Valley and and so in the last few weeks, you know, the moon is, if, if this is north, you know, I'm imaging sort of around here and the moon is over here. So you want, it, you, you want the moon to be at least like 60 degrees away from your target, right? Um, there is, unfortunately, uh, for me, the city of Scotts Valley is right here too. So there is kind of a light dome right where I'm, right where I'm imaging. 
but uh, just as an example, uh, you know, the Eagle Nebula is, is to the south, so it would have been away from that light dome, but uh, these other nebulas, the bubble and the, the wizard are more towards the north, towards the, the light dome. But yeah, darker, darker is always better. Um, so you would, in theory, uh, need more integration time under light polluted skies or moonlit skies to get the same result than you would at a, at a dark site. Does that, does that answer the question? You need to shoot more. Yeah, you need to shoot more. Okay, let's go to uh, the, the bubble nebula. So again, back to, to circa 2014. So here you can see um, my RC8 uh, carbon fiber, and at this point I'm still on the, on the Sirius mount, probably grossly overloaded there with the two counterweights on it, the two shield. Um, so I said, uh, you know, this bubble nebula is a pretty small target. Uh, so I was playing with uh, uh, DSLR trying to do narrowband, which is a huge challenge, right? Because you've got the Bayer matrix uh, putting a red, green, and blue filter in front of every pixel. Uh, um, and then you're trying to do narrowband on top of that. So basically you're wasting uh, uh, either two or three of the pixels, depending on whether it's green or some other color, that you have to turn off those channels because it's just noise, right? Because you, you can't, you know, you've got a red filter and then a green or a blue filter, that's those pixels, you just have to throw that away. So it's not, uh, it's, it's challenging and I was having to do like half hour uh, uh, sub exposures, which with this kind of a rig is super challenging, but anyway, uh, so what I ended up he with here, it says that I, uh, uh, I used the one-shot color and then layered in the, the H-alpha uh, to, to create that image. So that's what it looked like back then with the 8-inch, and then here's what I'm getting again in 75 minutes uh, under moonlit skies. And a uh, little different, a couple different techniques with this one. Uh, first of all, it, it, the, the, the science, the colors are, are wrong here, and I'll, I'll tell you why. I just didn't like the stuff that's blue was like a really bright pink or really electric magenta, and I wanted it to be red, and I, couldn't, I just couldn't <laughs> make it red no matter how hard I tried. Um, but I, ended, I just, you know, fooling around, and, and it turned it blue, and I liked it, so... And when I post on Astrobin, I said it's art, not science. So, uh, and I, you know, people like it. So whatever. Um, so, uh, you know, one of a, a different technique here is the synthetic luminance. So rather than just HA, um, I stacked without rejection uh, all three narrowband filters uh, to create a single luminance channel with all of the detail of all three uh, filters in it. So it's like a s synthetic uh, luminance. And then um, I'll demonstrate that and the, the high pass overlay to, to pull out some of, the, some of the detail you see there. Okay. Um, so back to Photoshop. Oh, what am I doing? I just want to go up. Bubble. So let's look at uh, this is the synthetic luminance I just want to show you. So um, that's what, what it looks like coming out of. Uh, Deep si um, sorry, CCD stack two, and then through uh, camera raw, and you know I think this is uh, you know things that noise that should th that either I forget now what I did with calibration files on this one, but um, you know I had to I had to deal with this. I don't think that should be there. Uh, all this noise in this corner here, um, but anyway, that's 
that's the sum or the average of the three channels together as a synthetic luminance. So, you know, I can talk about how I did that in CCD stack, but I'm not recommending anybody spend money on CCD stack. So I'm sure, I don't know, Bruce can tell you probably how to stack without um, uh, data rejection in PixInsight. I'm sure, anyway, synthetic luminance, okay. Uh, so what's the other thing I want to show you here? I got all these things open. Wizard, wizard, wizard. Oh, I didn't open it yet. Okay. Open bubble. So this uh, high pass overlay technique is one that came out of this Cave Nebula video from the Astro Imaging channel. And uh, this might be kind of subtle. So that's without, and that's with. Do you see it there? Out, with, and you know, maybe it goes too far. It's easy to, to take the sharpening too far and then it looks noisy, right? So it's always a, a trade off. So um, let's see, what else is going on here? Um, yeah, that's that bright pink or magenta that I didn't want. Um, that's what came directly out of the the normal uh, SHO or Hubble palette stuff. So that's why I went to that color layer. And, you know, here's the synthetic luminance here um, is pretty subtle too, actually. Um, but then this really makes the detail pop. So. So what this is, is a bunch of different uh, high pass filters, copies of the layer, and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, so it's sort of like uh, wavelet transformations, right? It's sort of like the, the uh, fine detail, you know, medium detail, so you can start and so the way this is how he does it is puts it in a folder, but I'll just I'll just do it again here. So we'll turn that off. So you know we're starting with the synthetic luminance. So we're going to make like five copies of that, right? So uh, why did I get a group? Because I drag it to the wrong folder. Okay, delete group. Sorry. Oh. All right, <laughs> try that again to here to make a copy. So I'm going to make five copies. And at five is an arbitrary number, but okay. And then he put them um, in a group or folder just for convenience. All right, and then so you select one and you go to filter, other, high pass, and then you start with, you know, maybe one, one pixel to where you can just barely see some edges okay and then let me turn these other layers off so we can see what we're doing okay so that looks like that and it's I don't know if you can see it but I can sort of just barely see the bubble there and then we want to turn that layer it was a luminosity layer because it was copied from the luminosity layer I want to turn that to an overlay okay so now if I turn that on and off, I can just barely see some detail coming in there. All right, so then for these other layers, you just repeat the process, right? So filter, I'm, uh, okay, make sure that the layer's selected and visible. Filter, other, high pass, this is begging for an action too, I guess. 
So we'll go to two pixels. So a little more detail there. And then again, you turn it to an overlay. And then, you know, we can turn the whole group on or off and you can see the results of, of that. So that's just, it's a sharpening detail enhancing and you can, you know, keep going up the, the chain to 10 pixels or, or whatever. So that's one way to, to uh, get some detail back in there. And, and so, um, again, if we look at, I think this is pretty close to my final image. Um, not that one, this one. Well, I probably then went back and softened it a little bit with some, some denoise. Oh, and I never showed you uh, Topaz denoise. Let's do it now. Um, so, and, and again, you know, I'm about to denoise something I just made sharp. So actually, let's, let's just, you know, this stuff on the outside here looks noisy and gross. So let's, uh, maybe we could use, uh, you know, this would be a good time for the luminance mask, right? So we could go actions. Create all luminosity masks. Channels. Um, Probably the inverse of that, right, is what we'd want. So I can do that. I mean, and again, the, the, I think the marching ants are, are kind of deceiving. I guess we'll see when we go and actually do it. Um, so jump over here and then take the uh, inverse of that and... We want to be, well, actually, I probably want to flatten this whole thing at this point, All right? So, okay, so now using that filter or that selection, I'm sorry, you can go get this topaz denoise. Okay, so we're not actually going to denoise that part, but down here where it's gritty and ugly. So, um, you know, obviously I'm not, I don't know if you can see these presets, they're, they're EOS camera presets, and obviously I, I don't, I'm not using an EOS camera, but I generally use these as presets, and then I just, you know, use the, keep going up in the ISO and kind of use the least destructive one that's, so probably like there. Um, and we'll see if that luminance mass did the right thing here too. Okay, so yeah. So even though it looks like all this stuff out here um, maybe shouldn't have been selected, it, it got, the, got the denoise, but we've still got our detail here. So anyway, that's the topaz denoise. And I, they've got a pretty, you know, just the front page of their um, website, you know, is a pretty dramatic um, demo thingy here. Let me just show you that real quick. So if you slide this guy you can see kind of dramatically the difference between, you know, here's a bunch of color noise. It would be like, for us, it would be like, you know, thermal noise where you, your ISO was too high, same thing. And, uh, you know, this is what, what this plugin can, can do to make it, look, uh, make it look better. So it's pretty cool. So I like that one. All right, let's go back to the PowerPoint. So 
So let me just check. So we did the synthetic luminance. We did the high pass filter overlay. We went back and did the topaz denoise. I forgot to show you. Okay, just another example. I'm not gonna. That's it for the for the demos. But just to talk about um, this thing about the the aperture versus the light pollution versus the number of images and all of that. So um, the bottom image. Um, you know, probably the darkest place I've imaged from is, is Pinnacles and the west side. So we did a, a camping trip a couple years ago, the club did. And uh, I had my 8-inch RC and my water-cooled Canon. And uh, Ed uh, helped me locate the, the Crescent Nebula, which I hadn't seen before, suggested it as a target. And um, I did... Uh, uh, again, the RGB plus an Oxygen 3 over the DSLR and took out all the noise and all that stuff. It's, I don't have a lot of notes about that image, but that's what it looked like in the end. And then here at the top, um, and I have to admit that I processed that top image all the way through from beginning to end four different times. Uh, especially after I saw the bottom one that I had done before, before I, I liked it. Um, top image, new rig, rig uh, this time 2.5 hours of uh, integration. It's bicolor, so no, there's not really any sulfur going on there in that uh, nebula. Uh, and then the RGB stars, and again, from Scotts Valley and under moonlight with all of the methods that I just showed you. So um, I don't think I can zoom in here, but you know, I, if you, I'm still working on, you know, the deconvolution and other things for bringing in the detail here. I probably overdid. Um, so it's, you know, I'm still learning some of these, some of these techniques. Okay. Uh, so some people steer away from uh, Richie Kreitian, you know, RCs. And by the way, that's the same optical design as the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, but they steer away from them because they say they're hard to collimate. And, um, you know, you can read endless sets of instructions on the, on the web, and I just got... When I'm before, I have, a, I have a 6, an 8-inch, and a 12-inch now. And uh, before, when I was trying to do the 6 and the 8, I just got more and more confused. The more I read, the more I didn't know what, what the heck I was doing. But um, it turns out, at least in, in this model, this 12-inch, there's a, there's a three-step process that's pretty straightforward. So, you know, in step one, uh, you know, the focuser can move relative to the OTA. So you're trying to make sure that that focuser is pointed right down the center of the optical axis and there's a little target on the secondary mirror um, and you just aim the center of the focuser to that target. So a couple different ways you can do that. Um, a Cheshire is just a big hunk of metal with a, with a hole drilled through it. Um, so you can sight through that thing and just see the, the center of the mirror. Uh, and then there's also laser and uh, targets. And uh, for the first two steps, it turns out you can use just this Orion laser that's designed for collimating uh, Newtonian telescopes. Um, so I got, I got one of those too. So again, the first step, align the focuser so it's pointed right down the optical axis to the center of the center of the secondary mirror. Uh, then you adjust the secondary mirror, and it's just going to tip tilt around that uh, centerpiece, so that if you shoot a laser down there, that the laser comes right back to the exact same spot. Uh, and then if you can also do it with the with the Cheshire. Um, and it's kind of hard to describe without, you can't really photograph through that narrow hole or I, there's probably YouTubes or stuff, but there's a way to do it with the Cheshire too. Um, the, the new laser from Orion has a, has a 45 degree angle target. So the laser comes out the center of that target, goes down, hits the mirror and comes back. 
and if it's you know somewhere other than the hole it came out of then it's then it's wrong so you adjust that secondary mirror to get the red dot of the laser to go back in the hole that it's being emitted from so that's the secondary and then lastly uh, the the primary you're trying to align so that it's um, you know aligned with with everything else and again uh, you can I, I did it mostly with the the Ch well I did it with the Cheshire um, and in that case you can see the housing of the secondary and uh, just making sure that it's centered around the circle that's the top side of the Cheshire and the um, target on the secondary all of those things are, are lined up in concentric circles um, and then you could get uh, the, the laser that's recommended for this is the Howie Glader holographic laser, which gives you a concentric target of rings that get projected on a flat surface. Unfortunately, he passed away recently, and uh, uh, I forget which company, it's Star something, Starlight, Star somebody, uh, is supposedly bought those designs from his estate and will be bringing them out. But in the meantime, uh, you can do this defocused uh, star test. So here's uh, some defocused stars. So you run the focuser out and it creates this donut pattern because of the center obstruction, right? So you're seeing the center obstruction and the veins that hold the center obstruction in place. And uh, by virtue of the fact that that's centered uh, and also that in the various corners that it's fairly centered. I, I can see this one in the lower left here is a little um, a little out. Uh, it's sort of telling me that the whole scope is well collimated except maybe for that one corner which might be some curvature or something. But uh, anyway, uh, you know, I was able to do this in maybe 40 minutes the first time and I think, you know, you'd get better at it the more the more you did it. And in, in theory, even if you had to do it each time you set up, you know, you drive the bumpy road and get somewhere and set up and then you could check your collimation and, and whip it into shape. I guess same you'd have to do with a visual newt or something probably too. Um, but it doesn't seem too, too daunting anymore that now that I understand it. So that's the RC collimation. And, and again, you know, these, these, uh, GSO, TPO, Astrotech, uh, RCs, they're all made by the same company in, in uh, Taiwan. Um, and uh, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of bang for the buck. Um, you know, it's certainly the most aperture for the buck for, for astroimaging. And uh, collimation was one reason people gave not to, not to do that. Um, another was the the focuser, everybody says, oh, they had to replace the focuser. But I found that once I put the, uh, the, uh, the focus motor, the servo on there, that the, the reason people were replacing it was because it wasn't holding their camera. Well, first of all, this camera is really light and the filter wheel is really light. And secondly, you know, my, my servo, you can't move the focuser with the servo on there in any way, shape or form. So that, you know, the focuser is basically holding it at whatever p position, so I don't I don't feel the need to replace that that focuser. Um, so anyway, um, this is just uh, you know other rigs I've had access to and played with along the way, my journey in in astro imaging. So you know I have the six and eight inch RCs at home. Uh, I built two rigs for the club. Um, 8 inch SCT and the uh, C102F um, and then I've collected a bunch of prime lenses for wide field from 8 millimeters to 500 millimeters. Um, I've played with different mounts mostly all of the Sky uh, uh, Cinta or Skywatcher Orion they're all the same manufacturer um, so the Cirrus and the Atlas and the HDX 110 are also known as the EQ8 in Europe are all uh, use the same software and everything. 
Uh, the club has an iopteron sky tracker. I've used it for, for wide field with lenses. And I talked about, you know, I've got a collection of, for me and for the club, various astro modified DSLRs I picked up and the, the monochrome uh, Nikon. And then the, the camera, uh, the club has the AS174 mm a cooled camera for their ccd rig and then i picked up the the 1600 for mine and then i use itelescope.net a lot so now you're talking you know up to two meter scopes and plan plane wave and all the high-end stuff on on mountaintops in australia spain uh in the desert of new mexico and there's one scope in the in the sierras so kind of the full spectrum there um, uh, so I promised that, you know, I'd post the links to all, uh, all the stuff I talked about. So those will be there on the meetup in the PDF. And that is my talk. Any questions? I heard you said a lot, uh, several times that you shot in moonlight. Yeah. No, there haven't been any dark nights yet. <laughs> so I've only had this scope for this month, right? So, I mean, it's not even polar aligned. I mean, it's just like, I'm just like going crazy with this scope. So it's every night that, that hasn't been completely socked in, I've been collecting narrow band imaging. So, I mean, the, you know, the, I took my, I had uh, this crazy um, tandem, uh, rig with the eight inch and the six inch RC both on there at the same time with the the color DSLR on the six inch and the monochrome DSLR with the filter wheel on the eight inch and uh, w the water cooling and all that stuff and uh, I just took all that off and just dropped this scope right on there and I haven't realigned it or 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 anything um, so there's a number of steps that I haven't you know, that, that you would normally do. Um, I am doing peck now, Bruce, um, um, you know, so, but, yeah, it, but it's, it hasn't been, uh, you know, this next weekend will be the, the new moon, so we'll be out at, out at Coyote doing a, a workshop, um, and that'll be the first uh, dark, you know, no moon to deal with, so. Um, this I always show this image because this is like my best image I ever did. But this actually comes from uh, itelescope.net, and this is the same scope that Bruce has now, that or maybe a slightly different model, uh, Takahashi. This one's in Australia, and this is a, a portion of a bigger uh, picture. Um, I cropped this to to make a metal print. Um, uh, so this is a, a mosaic of three frames that are kind of vertical across this thing. And this is actually a diagonal crop of the original picture. But there's like 250 sub-exposures here, and it's, it's LRGB. And they're all through this uh, Takahashi that's in uh, Australia at Siding Springs. And then they have another one in New Mexico that's set up exactly the same except the camera's flipped 90, 90 degrees. So for this mosaic, I needed to use the one in, in Australia. And I spent um, over a year gathering the data for this. Um, so anyway, it was kind of a, a long effort. But, and this was, uh, you know, I stole this idea from uh, Rogelio. Uh, I saw his, you know, of course his is bigger and wider and better. Uh, and I think he's done it yet again after that, even bigger and wider. Um, but, you know, I got inspired to try to do a, a mosaic of the, all the cool stuff in Orion from from one of his images. And I told him that, and he says he likes mine too, so that makes me feel good. So, <laughs> yeah, so anyway, that's, uh, that's, that's my best image to date, I guess. So. Why did you choose to go down there? So, 
when I was first picking out the gear, you know, I went on Astrobin and looked in to see what people were doing, and I found a particular guy that had um, what I thought I was interested in, which was the 8-inch RC and a astrophysics focal reducer and a DSLR at that time. I think he's moved on as well. Um, so I could see the kind of things that he was doing, and it was the type of DSOs and stuff that I wanted to do. So that that's kind of, and again, um, you know, originally, uh, you know, Ed uh, uh, said, oh, you should get a, a refractor, you should get a, one of these, what's the quad, um, Astrotech, uh, yeah, AT65 EDQ as a, as a beginning scope. And that might have been the smart thing to do, less challenging because of the wider field, easier to guide. But, you know, I looked at what he was shooting with that, uh, you know, the North American Nebula and, and the California. And it's like, well, okay, that's nice. Now what? You know, I wanted to, <laughs> I was impatient, I guess. I wanted to go deeper. I wanted to, you know, uh, so I went for the, went for the RC. And the diff diffraction spikes don't bother me. They're in the Hubble images, so what's, you know. Uh, regarding the SCT, um, so I didn't have any experience with an SCT until uh, I put together the rig for the club. And that particular one is, is old and it's got holes drilled in it and all kinds of funky stuff, but uh, they do up really easy compared to the, to the RC, because you have the big hunk of glass in the front. Right, you got an eight-inch flat piece of glass, uh, and it dews up really easy. So that was the first time that I had to had to use a dew heater versus just a dew shield. Um, and then it, it, you know, it would dew up on the inside. And then what do you do, right? You know, you got there with the blow dryer up the <laughs> off the wazoo. Yeah, it's probably not a smart. So anyway, so that was a challenge. And the other thing is uh, mirror flop. So that particular scope doesn't have a, a mirror lock on it. So when, when you get to the point where you're trying to automate stuff so that you can sleep at night, you know, and you kind of do it in steps. Like I was imaging up to the meridian and having everything shut down or, or park or stop at that point. But, you know, I want to I use the whole night. So I want to do a, a, an auto meridian flip. So, you know, Sequence Generator Pro can do that. But once you uh, flip the uh, flip the the mirror, oh, there's some slop, and that particular rig doesn't have a autofocus on it, so um, it goes out of focus when you do the meridian flip. So if I was out there, I could refocus it, or if I had autofocus, I could refocus it. But without a mirror lock or autofocus, it's not going to run by itself. So those are some things about SCTs. I don't know if there's others. Um, again, I, my perception is they're, that they're more expensive for a given aperture. Because, you know, the RC is a pretty simple design. I and mean, the only thing that makes it challenging is the, the shape of the mirrors is, is hard to do, right? They're, they're hyperbolic, I believe, um, versus parabolas um, or round. Um, and you know, with the so they're less they're less complicated with an SCT. You've got that big corrector plate with the secondary embedded in it, and and all of that. So I think that it, it'll cost you more. Um, so. Uh, so when I first I tried <laughs> to use a field flattener, and I could never get it to work with the focal reducer, and they're not really designed to work together. Um, so I finally, you know, I had some help with, um, the machining and all that from Mark, not Strybeck, but yeah, the other Mark, and, uh, still could never quite, uh, get the two to play nice together. Um, so I do have, with the 8-inch, I did have a little bit of curvature. Um, I'm not really seeing anything that's bothering me 
and and you know you can control it by how much focal reduction that you do use right so if you have less focal reduction you'll have less curvature um, so it's doable and crop out the edges too <laughs> yeah any other questions okay thank you for coming